Although actually I first met uh, uh, Pierre uh, a very long time ago in um, 80, it was uh, 79, uh, 80 uh, at, uh, at CERN. Uh, um, today I'm going uh, to, to, to refer uh, to our interaction uh, in, the, um, in these last, uh, last few years. I must say that uh, I remember when we first met at CERN, uh, we were discussing about uh, grand unification uh, and uh, aspects of physics beyond the standard model. Uh, and I would say that uh, ma many of the topics uh, we were discussing uh, 30 or 40 years ago are still uh, present um, in the present activity, as we heard this morning. Eh? In the meantime, uh, uh, both in the case of Pierre and also in my case, uh, we enlarged uh, the, the, the scope of the research, including uh, uh, more aspects uh, of astroparticle physics. And uh, in fact, uh, our interaction uh, uh, between Pierre and me in these uh, last years uh, was mainly uh, related uh, to programs uh, in uh, uh, astroparticle uh, physics uh, at the European level. Uh, um, uh, Pierre entered uh, the uh, Scientific Advisory Committee of APEC. APEC is uh, the consortium uh, the, of the agencies uh, in Europe, research agencies in Europe, uh, um, uh, interested also in um, astroparticle uh, physics. Uh, the consortium has uh, something like uh, 16 countries uh, with uh, 20 among agencies, uh, institutions belonging to this, uh, to this consortium. Uh, we have also the presence of other important uh, and uh, close by, say, in physics, uh, 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 institutions like CERN, ECFA, ISO, all these institutions are sitting as uh, representatives uh, in the General Assembly of APEC. Crucial for uh, the preparation uh, of the roadmap of uh, uh, APEC, the new roadmap uh, 1726, was in fact the action uh, of the scientific advisory uh, committee, which really provided uh, the scientific material uh, for the General Assembly of APEC to formulate, uh, to formulate this uh, roadmap. Now, we were lucky in this sense because uh, if you consider uh, the period uh, between uh, the last uh, 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 APEC uh, roadmap, uh, say five or six uh, years ago, and uh, today, well, in this uh, interval of time, uh, in fact, uh, we had uh, really a, a, a major successes uh, in uh, astroparticle physics. Uh, in, the two, in the two infinities, as we said at this, um, at this meeting, the infinity of a microcosmos, uh, we have uh, the establishment uh, of the uh, standard model of particle physics. In the infinity of a macrocosmos, uh, we had uh, the establishment of what we consider uh, the uh, uh, standard cosmological model, so the Landa CDM uh, model, and in particular, uh, a point that, in fact, we discussed many times with, uh, uh, with Pierre in this uh, last period uh, was the relevance uh, of, um, of, the, um, of the information coming uh, from the cosmic background radiation. As we heard this morning, it is really an incredible source uh, of information, probably the only way or one of the very few ways uh, we have uh, to go uh, deep uh, into the very early stages uh, uh, of the universe. In the meantime, uh, as we heard also from uh, Stavros, uh, we had uh, the discovery of 
two important uh, cosmic uh, messengers, uh, the high energy neutrinos, uh, cosmic neutrinos, uh, and uh, the gravitational waves. So overall, uh, this uh, picture uh, really of, uh, of the effort uh, that we were talking about uh, 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 many years ago with uh, Pierre about the unification uh, of fundamental interactions, uh, so accelerator physics uh, going up uh, in energy, as uh, some kind uh, of uh, counterpart uh, in the other, uh, on the other side of the infinity, the, the large uh, uh, infinity, in the evolution uh, of the universe uh, starting uh, from uh, its uh, very early early moments, uh, and essentially the mechanism of phase transition uh, uh, is a mechanism which uh, unifies uh, these uh, two uh, ways uh, uh, of looking uh, at the universe, uh, giving really a powerful, uh, an extremely powerful uh, uh, image uh, of that unity of microcosmos and macrocosmos that was emphasized uh, at this uh, meeting. Having said this, uh, uh, we have in front of us, uh, as we heard also here, uh, uh, formidable problems. If you want uh, just to make it uh, short, uh, uh, let me put uh, these uh, formidable problems into five numbers. Uh, five numbers that we are not able uh, to explain uh, uh, at the moment, uh, five fundamental numbers. Uh, the first uh, refers to the mass uh, of the neutrinos. Uh, and uh, I don't mean uh, only the value of the, of the mass of the neutrinos, uh, but also the nature uh, of the mass of the neutrinos. I think uh, this is uh, really a crucial uh, problem to understand also the fundamental uh, uh, symmetries uh, of the universe. The other uh, the two numbers uh, refer uh, to the so-called dark side uh, of the universe, uh, dark matter uh, and dark energy. Then uh, we have uh, this uh, zero, which is a very important uh, number, in particular for uh, our uh, survival and presence uh, here today, which is uh, the uh, uh, um, asym cosmic asymmetry between uh, matter um, and uh, antimatter. Then, if you want, uh, the last number is a kind of provocative uh, number, uh, is the fact that uh, if, you, if you ask uh, a student uh, what is uh, uh, how much energy is there in the vacuum? Uh, the student probably is going to say, well, uh, the X boson has a vacuum uh, expectation value, which means uh, the energy carried in the vacuum by this, uh, this boson, this fills uh, the entire universe. So the energy of the vacuum uh, is uh, corresponding to the 100 GV of the uh, vacuum expectation value of the X boson. In this case, uh, you uh, get an answer uh, which is uh, 60 or even more uh, than 60 orders of magnitude uh, above uh, the value that we find uh, for uh, corresponding to the critical uh, energy density. So if you want, uh, the last number refers uh, to the well-known problem of the cosmological constant uh, or uh, the uh, hierarchy, the, the, the large hierarchy problem. Now, this uh, roadmap uh, intends uh, to tackle, uh, if you want, uh, the fundamental uh, questions uh, brought about uh, uh, by these uh, five uh, mysterious uh, numbers, uh, and uh, tries to do, to do this uh, envisaging uh, 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 these uh, four uh, 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 different uh, sectors uh, uh, to, to attack uh, say the, the problem, uh, to tackle uh, the problem, namely the high energy universe. So uh, what is related to messengers uh, of the uh, most energetic uh, regions in the universe, so gammas, neutrinos, cosmic rays and gravitational waves. Then we have uh, the uh, uh, dark universe, so dark matter and dark energy. 
the early phases of the universe, so cosmology, CMB, and the neutrino uh, properties related to the mass and mixings in the neutrino sector. Now, as Stavros was pointing out this morning, uh, there is a very important difference if you look uh, at the topics uh, present uh, in the uh, 2011 uh, uh, um, roadmap. Namely, there is now the appearance of the two blue new uh, uh, topics, dark energy and CMB. Now, this is a, a, a relevant uh, point that we discussed a lot, in fact, uh, in uh, APEC, namely whether uh, our astroparticle physics community had to include also uh, uh, subjects related to uh, cosmology uh, and if this was appropriate. And uh, it, um, I think that it is becoming more and more clear, at least in my view, but indeed, uh, differently from uh, the, the situation in 2011, uh, so five or six years later, uh, by now it is very clear that uh, dark energy and CMB enters uh, really at the roots uh, of what we are doing, uh, trying uh, to understand uh, the universe at large through uh, um, properties of the standard model of particle physics and vice versa. So, uh, I, uh, I underline this point because this was uh, indeed uh, a major uh, point made also by Pierre uh, in the Scientific Advisory Committee. He was, in my view, correctly enough, uh, insisting that indeed uh, these are uh, topics uh, which can uh, shed light uh, in, in a very profound way on uh, our search for new physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. So, indeed, uh, uh, we uh, took these uh, two topics uh, into account, uh, and uh, clearly we are aware that there are also other communities. We have also a roadmap for astrophysics by Astronet. We have also a roadmap now uh, um, there is the process uh, of, um, of a new uh, roadmap uh, on, uh, on a particle, uh, European particle physics, uh, which has uh, started. But we think that uh, these uh, subjects can no longer uh, be ignored by our community. So, if you want, uh, pictorially, this is the kind of a representation uh, of a three fronts uh, of investigation uh, that we envisaged for, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, new roadmap. Now, if you want uh, the key point of the roadmap, the roadmap concerns uh, the, uh, um, uh, the present uh, and the future, uh, future uh, large research infrastructures uh, related uh, to uh, uh, the uh, nine topics uh, that uh, I mentioned before. So you see here uh, cosmology, neutrino physics, uh, and the high energy uh, universe. Well, what is interesting uh, is that for uh, each of these uh, research topics, uh, there is an intense program uh, of um, research infrastructures covering uh, not only the remaining 10 years, but as we heard also this morning, uh, going uh, much beyond the 10 years, uh, going uh, into the uh, decades of the 30s, uh, say, uh, uh, in, front, uh, in front of us. Now, this is a very rich program, uh, but obviously I'm not going now to, to, to discuss. You can find uh, this discussion in our, uh, in our roadmap. But this is to give you an idea that uh, um, there is a clearly a, a, a plan by, by our um, astroparticle uh, physics uh, community in Europe uh, inserted uh, into a more global uh, uh, strategy for astroparticle physics for the next uh, uh, 20 years in terms uh, of these large research infrastructures. Now, the question is... Um, are we ready in Europe uh, to, to, <laughs> to embark 
in this clearly challenging uh, adventure to develop uh, and to exploit uh, then uh, such uh, an impressive uh, 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 array of uh, um, new research, uh, larger research infrastructures. Well, let me say that uh, uh, Europe clearly has uh, the, uh, um, the human resources uh, and the technological resources to face uh, such a kind uh, of um, ambitious uh, challenge. A problem, uh, however, that uh, we all feel in Europe is that differently from uh, other uh, regions in the world, here it is uh, difficult uh, to, uh, um, to converge, uh, in particular in a short amount of time, uh, into critical uh, decisions uh, if, you consider, uh, if you consider, as uh, I told you, that uh, we have uh, something like, uh, you see, uh, 16 countries, we have uh, 20 agencies uh, sitting uh, around uh, the table uh, and obviously each one uh, has uh, its own budget and uh, there's also uh, its own uh, interests, interests which can be overlapping with the interests of other agencies but not always uh, be, be the same. So it is the usual problem of Europe uh, to speak uh, with uh, one voice uh, uh, having uh, so many countries with uh, different um, um, attitudes. Now, APEC, uh, uh, APEC in fact, uh, has uh, really the, this purpose, if you want. It was born by the idea of presidents of uh, some of the main agencies in Europe to say, OK, let's sit around the table and let's try to coordinate our action. So the first part uh, of APEC uh, was, uh, in fact, uh, the phase of coordination. Uh, the final C of APEC originally meant uh, coordination, uh, European uh, Astroparticle Physics Coordination. Uh, then the C uh, from coordination moved to consortium. So nowadays APEC says, OK, it, it is uh, certainly good to sit around the table uh, and speak together, you tell me what you are doing in your agency, I tell you what I am doing, and so on. But then uh, we must go from the moment uh, of sitting around the table uh, and discussing it to a more operative phase. That's the reason why APEC moved to the final present uh, final C, which it means uh, consortium, uh, with uh, the idea really of uh, taking uh, uh, concrete uh, actions uh, to, uh, to prove uh, this uh, uh, unity of uh, uh, intentions uh, in Europe concerning astroparticle physics. So APEC, apart from uh, uh, the, the coordination uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the point of communicating that I said as really concrete actions, in particular the promotion of uh, uh, global or European uh, strategies on specific topics. Already this morning uh, it was mentioned, uh, for instance, uh, we had uh, a, a series uh, of global uh, neutrino meetings and these were effective in the sense that uh, some uh, uh, strategies were uh, put forward and agreed also at a global level. The same thing, in particular, thanks to the initiative of, uh, of Stavros, I must say, is going on on CMB. Also there, the community is rather articulated, say, around the world, the community interested on CMB. APEC is trying to, to, to make uh, a, a coordination and uh, to take a kind of global view on, uh, on this, uh, and so on. The other important point uh, is the exploitation uh, of the uh, technological uh, uh, transfer uh, with uh, um, high-tech uh, European uh, uh, industry. Uh, then uh, APEC uh, has been uh, and uh, is now also 
promoting uh, some of the largest uh, infrastructures uh, in Europe. Think, for instance, of the project CTA, just at the very origin of the project, APEC uh, played a relevant role in trying uh, to stimulate uh, and then uh, favorite the first steps of this major, uh, major project. Nowadays, uh, We are talking, for instance, about uh, a major project for gravitational waves, uh, underground interferometer, uh, the Einstein uh, telescope project, uh, and APEC is, in fact, trying to promote it also with uh, calls on R&D on uh, this, and then acting in, in Brussels, uh, trying uh, to uh, uh, support the uh, start and the evolution of such a kind of projects. As I said, our roadmap uh, is, uh, uh, um, is um, in contact, uh, say, with uh, other uh, analogous roadmaps uh, in uh, astrophysics and astronomy and uh, in particle physics. Uh, at the moment, APEC is uh, sitting in the committee, in the preparatory committee for uh, the uh, um, European uh, particle physics uh, Uh, roadmap. We are also in uh, strict uh, contact uh, with uh, the astrophysics community of uh, Astronet. And I think this is uh, important, important at the European, uh, if not at the global level, uh, but really these words that uh, in the past were somewhat uh, isolated, uh, at least in the uh, scientific uh, policy Uh, attitude of uh, astronomy and astrophysics on one side and particle physics on the other side may find a kind of common language through uh, astroparticle physics and the issue of the two infinities uh, that we mentioned also here is not only nice words uh, for the public opinion or for, uh, for the newspapers outside, it is a reality the fact that uh, the two standard models really have a, a mutual benefit uh, through their uh, uh, interaction. Now, the roadmap uh, has uh, a, a set of recommendations, uh, scientific recommendations, uh, uh, indications for organizational issues, uh, and uh, the impact uh, of, on the society of astroparticle physics. In particular, uh, I underlined here two recommendations, which, uh, in fact, we, uh, we discussed a lot, uh, in particular the first one uh, with, uh, with Pierre, and um, it was really a pity that um, uh, with Pierre uh, we worked uh, really at the last stages of the roadmap, but unfortunately he could not see the final uh, Uh, the final uh, product uh, of uh, these uh, um, efforts. But uh, the two points uh, are, uh, uh, the first theory, um, this started a long time ago, maybe t 10 or 15 years ago, in particular through the action uh, of a colleague of ours, uh, Subir um, Sarkar, uh, the idea of uh, saying, okay, we have a lot of uh, astroparticle theory activity in Europe. Is it possible to give rise uh, to a European center for astroparticle theory? This will be important also for the experimental activities going on, because this could become a reference point also for the experimental community to talk with. And uh, with Pierre, we had, in fact, uh, discussed uh, some aspects uh, of uh, this center, and uh, we are going to have a proposal soon, and this will be related also to this preparatory phase where Pierre contributed, um, contributed a lot. And, in fact, I must say that... Uh, In a sense, we were thinking of Piera as a possible uh, leader uh, of this initiative for uh, at least for the initial uh, uh, phase, uh, given uh, his experience and uh, his wisdom. The other uh, point is education. Uh, we insist a lot that astroparticle theory 
in, uh, in this moment uh, is really attracting, uh, uh, attracting public opinion in general, uh, but in particular young people. Uh, I see that uh, when students uh, come uh, to ask me about a thesis, uh, first I offer a thesis on uh, particle physics, uh, flavor physics and so on. Then I say, okay, I also uh, am interested in some aspects of uh, dark matter or uh, nutrient. And uh, I must say that 90%, uh, not to, to say all of the young people, say, ah, yes, yes, the topic on particle physics is certainly interesting. Uh, however, I would like <laughs> to work for my thesis on the astroparticle. But apart from my personal experience, I must say that I see also around, uh, we made uh, some uh, also statistics, uh, some uh, study in APEC about uh, this impact on education and we see that uh, really um, this is uh, very, very attractive uh, and um, Pierre was telling me a lot about uh, this experience, uh, gravity we heard about uh, uh, yesterday and um, I think we should really exploit this uh, extraordinary uh, power of attraction that astroparticle physics says. Our roadmap uh, is a resource aware roadmap. So we did not intend uh, to write down a kind of book uh, or dreams uh, of uh, beautiful things uh, that one uh, could do having uh, an infinite budget at disposal uh, or at least a very large budget at disposal. So we tried uh, to ask ourselves uh, how much uh, the agencies in Europe uh, put uh, every year uh, on average uh, in uh, astroparticle physics. Uh, obviously well aware that uh, there are uh, many other important uh, funds uh, which are not coming uh, from the APEC agencies uh, uh, invested uh, into astroparticle physics. Now skipping uh, the details, uh, the message I want to convey to you is that the roadmap says, look, with uh, the budget, uh, average budget that at the moment the agencies put, considering uh, the range of infrastructures that I was mentioning uh, uh, before, uh, it is clear that this uh, exceeds uh, uh, the uh, uh, amount uh, available. However, we are not uh, off uh, by some uh, huge, uh, huge factor. In other words, uh, including uh, uh, European, in particular regional uh, structural funds, uh, including the important uh, funds coming from other communities, in particular the astrophysics uh, community. The European Space Agency, just to make an example, is essentially covering uh, here uh, uh, what uh, concerns, uh, uh, um, for instance, uh, space, uh, space missions. Well, the overall message is that uh, you can indeed uh, uh, think of uh, a, a, a reasonable uh, uh, roadmap uh, path in front of you for the next uh, 10 years, uh, not uh, saying uh, I wanted to have a budget which is uh, five or ten times uh, the budget that uh, uh, I have at the moment. Okay, we heard already a lot about uh, gravitational waves. This is uh, clearly one of the pillars of our roadmap. Let me only insist uh, uh, here that, uh, um, you know, in Europe we could have really in the uh, next uh, 10 or better 20 years, uh, a formidable uh, uh, um, array of, uh, of uh, ways, uh, say, of detectors uh, for uh, gravitational waves, going uh, from the upgrade uh, of the surface uh, uh, detector, the Virgo, uh, the Virgo um, interferometer, to the underground uh, uh, interferometer, so the Einstein telescope, and uh, as we heard uh, just before lunch, uh, through the uh, uh, space uh, interferometer. 
An important topic on which, uh, 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 in particular, Pierre contributed uh, was uh, the uh, dark energy aspect, uh, and in particular, uh, the uh, exploration of the two main uh, uh, ways to, uh, to look uh, at the galaxy surveys through the spectroscopic and the photometric uh, uh, approach. Here are the recommendations where, in particular, the role of Euclid is, uh, um, is underlined. In particular, this is uh, relevant not only for dark energy, uh, but also for other uh, important aspects of astroparticle physics, for instance, uh, uh, properties related to uh, masses and numbers number of neutrino species. It is remarkable uh, uh, how much the advent of Euclid combined with what we know from Planck can give in terms of sensitivity to both these uh, quantities. In conclusion, uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, and this was uh, completely shared by, by Pierre, uh, well, in fact, if possible, uh, uh, Pierre was uh, even uh, more um, enthusiastic and passionate about astroparticle physics uh, than uh, the, the, our all uh, APEC community. It was really a, a major force uh, in, this, uh, in this work of pushing uh, for uh, the relevance of astroparticle physics and the relevance of having uh, large research infrastructures uh, in this field uh, in Europe. So we are living this extraordinary moment. Uh, we must uh, try to convey really uh, also in, the, in, uh, in our uh, living memory of what uh, Pierre was uh, uh, insisting about. Uh, uh, we have uh, to, to convey this uh, important message that Europe uh, has an enormous potential uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, um, scientific, uh, human uh, resource technology in astroparticle uh, physics. Uh, and so it should be conceivable that uh, in the FP9, the next uh, European framework program, uh, there should be an overall uh, research infrastructure area program uh, dedicated uh, to, uh, um, astroparticle, uh, to astroparticle physics. Let me conclude uh, with, um, with a thank you. Uh, thank you to Pierre uh, because um, I really uh, enjoyed very much uh, the insight he uh, had, uh, what I call here uh, wisdom, uh, which is uh, uh, which is not uh, something that you find uh, so frequently <laughs> around. Uh, um, his vision, uh, uh, sometimes uh, really be a, a passionate, uh, enthusiastic vision uh, for uh, the future, but together uh, always uh, with uh, this wisdom uh, aspect uh, that uh, characterized uh, all uh, uh, his action. An enormous uh, passion, I would say, enthusiasm, really, for, uh, for physics in general, in particular uh, for uh, astroparticle physics. Uh, I would say also that uh, I'm going to miss uh, his uh, elegance. Elegance uh, is uh, here in a broad meaning. Uh, I think he was really an elegant uh, person uh, in the way of looking at things, uh, in the, in the way of uh, expressing uh, uh, his um, contact uh, with, other, uh, with other people and uh, with, uh, with reality. And at the end, uh, I must say, although I didn't know him sufficiently uh, deeply, but uh, for, for the aspects uh, I, I was in touch with him, uh, Really, I'm going to miss most, the most important thing of the friendship with him. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me today to, to speak here. I'm very moved uh, to speak at uh, this, uh, this symposium about Pierre. Um, 
So I will try to, uh, to speak, uh, to describe what happened in the last few years in the um, Earth-based uh, gravitational wave astronomy and, uh, and to discuss what uh, we would like to do. Uh, so uh, you know that uh, uh, the story starts uh, on 14 of September 2015 with this uh, signal. Uh, with this uh, signal produced by the coalescence of two black holes, uh, about uh, uh, each one about 30 uh, solar masses, and uh, and and the signal crosses LIGO, the two LIGOs, uh, the two LIGOs were uh, operating since a couple of days, and it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful signal. It's a, it's a very strong signal that you can. Uh, almost, uh, 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 it's, it's almost visible by eye in the data with some very basic filtering, uh, some uh, band pass, uh, you can see it by eye, it can make the exercise. Um, and um, and, and, and this, this gravitational wave uh, uh, also crossed uh, the APC, um, and this is, uh, uh, this is thanks, thanks to Pierre, uh, Pierre is, uh, is considered, he, is, he, is, uh, he, he was the, the man of uh, the LISA project, uh, the head of the LISA France uh, uh, consortium, but uh, he, he pushed a lot to have a Virgo group uh, here at APC. Uh, it was not uh, the only one who helped, uh, there are other people in this room. But uh, Pierre pushed a lot and gave a lot of resources to us when we decided to, to, to come here. And, uh, and, and thanks, to, thanks to Pierre, uh, the, the first detection uh, paper uh, uh, contains 10, 10 people from the APC group. And the APC uh, uh, contributed to the data analysis. And, and also, uh, we are very proud that one of the APC members was the co-chair of the paper writing committee the, of this paper, who is signed by a thousand of voters. Um, so the story, uh, in fact, uh, started uh, in Pisa uh, with Galileo, you know, the, this... Uh, uh, university of a free fall uh, and uh, came back it, it's coming back to Pisa uh, because in August 2017 Virgo entered in the in the gravitational wave network so to LIGO plus plus Virgo uh, and uh, and started to August uh, 2017 uh, so we have three detectors working and f for about a month, uh, uh, the three detectors uh, took data together. And, uh, and the first triple uh, detection ar arrived on uh, August 14, 2017. It was the coalescence of two black holes uh, again. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and you see in the, in the, in the, in the picture the, the spots uh, in the sky, uh, the localization in the skies of the different events uh, before uh, uh, GW170814, which is on the bottom. And you see that uh, the, the spot for the three detector localization is, mu is much smaller. We, we move from 1,000 of square degrees uh, to about 60 square degrees. So you it's it's really it's really an important uh, an important improvement uh, which is not uh, the localization you can have with a telescope on the you, you see uh, for comparison the um, the uh, the area uh, of of the moon but uh, but still it's it's a big improvement <clears throat> and also in this case uh, uh, the APC contributed, and and uh, and and uh, here uh, there is another another uh, role of Pierre. So um, Pierre already said that the APC should, comp should contribute uh, before uh, the projects uh, and uh, after the end, uh, not in the middle, uh, not with the construction. But he pushed uh, us to contribute to the hardware to the. To the construction of the Virgo detector. So we the, the gravitational wave passes through Virgo and passes through some uh, instrumentation built at APC for Virgo, and this is also 
something that uh, was very important uh, to us and was, uh, it was, it was uh, pushed uh, by, by Pierre. So you see here one of the, uh, some, some mirrors, so one of the telescope, mode matching telescope of the Virgo detector we built uh, here in the, in the um, optical laboratory and uh, in the workshop of, uh, of APC. A um, lot of people uh, continue to hate me because we, monop we, we took the mechanical workshop for about a year to build this stuff. And then uh, uh, the binary neutron star merger came uh, on 17 of August 2017. And this was another, another, uh, another surprise because, I mean, three days uh, later there was the triple detection. You see here on the, on the bottom uh, the gravitational wave uh, uh, signal, uh, so the spectrogram, so on the x-axis you have the time, the last 10 seconds, but actually the signal, we, we could see the signal for a hundred, a hundred of seconds. And uh, on the, on the, on the x-axis there is the frequencies. Um, and um, and uh, on, the, on the top, you see uh, the signal detected, detected uh, by the uh, coincident, uh, the, the, gamma, the gamma ray burst. So we have a ga gravitational wave and two seconds after a gamma ray burst detected by integral uh, and by Fermi. And, uh, and this, this is a coincidence which is more than five sigma coincidence. So it means that the two, two events came from the same source. And it was the first experimental uh, uh, strong evidence that the, so the, the, um, the short gamma ray bursts, at least some of them, come from uh, uh, neutron star measures. And, uh, and, uh, and you have seen uh, the, the, the very good localization of uh, um, uh, the event of the triple uh, um, coincidence of 14 of August, the same, uh, the same uh, very good localization uh, was uh, obtained for the 17 of August, uh, so about 30 square degrees. And this uh, very good localization uh, um, uh, um, was, uh, uh, um, was able to, uh, um, to, to identify uh, the, the search, uh, the, the host, host galaxy of the binary neutron star merger by a campaign of observation by about 70 telescopes, electromagnetic uh, and neutrino telescopes. So the, the, um, there was this campaign of observations, which was not only... Uh, uh, release of information to, to astronomers, but was also, uh, the, uh, was also the achievement of very, a very long preparatory, preparatory work in terms of organization, in terms of agreement between different communities, in terms of, uh, in terms of technical developments. So uh, a kilo nova was identified uh, in, the, in the, the galaxy, and the kilo nova uh, was identified in the position uh, uh, told by LIGO and Virgo. And so this was another uh, very important discovery, so the link between the kilo nova and the binary interstar merger. A link which was theoretically, uh, I mean, uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, predicted but not, not observed. And also in this case, there is a, there is a role by Pierre. Uh, th th you see here the, the title uh, uh, and of, the, of, the, uh, of the paper, of the publication signed by uh, more than 3,000 uh, 3, 3, people. Uh, it's the capstone, what we call the capstone paper, the paper containing all the observations, gravitational, uh, electromagnetic, and neutrinos, all the, all the multi-messenger observation relative to the binary neutron star measure. And, uh, and there, there are many groups uh, coming from MPC signing this paper, uh, more than 30 authors of this paper. Uh, uh, comes from uh, APC, uh, gravitational waves, uh, electromagnetic experiment and, uh, um, and neutrino. So uh, that's the, uh, in this plot, uh, it's a summary of observations uh, 
of the uh, five uh, black hole mergers uh, in blue, uh, so four by LIGO and one by LIGO and Virgo. And, uh, and uh, in, in violet, you see the, uh, the masses of uh, black hole uh, black holes uh, detected by X-ray uh, binaries. So you see that there is a new population of black hole, uh, black holes uh, uh, detected by 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 LIGO, by LIGO and Virgo. And uh, on the bottom of the plot, uh, so the X, the Y scale is the mass in solar masses. And on the bottom of, of the plot, there is the, the the binary neutron star detected on 17 of August. So that's the summary of the the, the observations uh, so far. And now the detectors are in uh, in uh, in, up, in an up upgrading phase. So there were uh, two, two wonderful years, 2015-2017. Uh, We've uh, detected uh, the gravitational waves uh, after a, a century. Um, we demonstrated that the gravitational wave travel at, at the speed of light uh, with uh, 10 to the minus 15 uh, precision. So there are two seconds delay between the gamma ray burst and the gravitational wave over a, a, a travel of 100 million years. And uh, we did also some first tests of the polarization of the gravitational uh, wave. And this was possible uh, uh, with the event of the 14th of August because uh, the two LIGO are aligned, so you cannot measure, the, you cannot um, uh, disentangle between different polarization, but Virgo is not aligned with the two LIGO. So we, having the three detectors also allowed to, to test the polarization. So first measurements, first very important measurement about the, the, the gravitational wave, it's also first test of gravity in strong in the strong field regime. So there are many tests that uh, the wave, the phase of the wave of the gravitational wave uh, in different time, in the spiral, in the post-spiral phase, uh, all the wave, everything is coherent uh, and it, it's in agreement with the general relativity. And then uh, there are results about astrophysics and cosmology, first link between soft, um, sh short gamma ray burst and gravitational waves, first, uh, um, uh, first uh, um, demonstration of the link between gravitational, uh, binary neutral star merger and kilonova. And for the first time, uh, we observed uh, the, uh, the black hole, black hole mergers. Uh, we, we observe that black holes uh, uh, are formed in binaries and they can uh, merge in, the, in Hubble time. And there is also a first measurement of neutron star uh, tidal deformability. And uh, we'll come back uh, uh, to this point later. And uh, uh, last but not least, an alternative measurement of the Hubble constant. And uh, I will also show uh, a plot later. And, uh, and the data are, 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 uh, are uh, public now. Uh, the first uh, data taking uh, uh, is, is completely public. Uh, and uh, so there are, um, there are websites where the, the LIGO and Virgo data uh, are, uh, can be downloaded with many, many uh, uh, tools uh, and tutorials. So now you, you can analyze the data. So a few words about these detectors. So, so the, the principle is very simple. Uh, if you have a clock, uh, a light beam, and a mirror, you can measure the round trip of the, of the light. Uh, and uh, if your clock is enough stable, you can uh, measure uh, um, difference in, uh, in time intervals. You can detect the pass passing of a gravitational wave. The reality is different because uh, your clock is not enough stable and you need an interferometer, so you need a laser beam, two arms, and, uh, and uh, that's a micro interferometer. But the reality is more complex and you need a much more complex instrument, which, a mo each, each, which is a modified micro interferometer. And uh, on the bottom of the slide, you see a, a scheme of, of uh, those detectors. LIGO and Virgo are very similar. And the challenges are that you need to measure 10 to the minus 21 as a strain, which correspond of 10 to roughly 10 to the minus 18 meters uh, uh, um, over three kilometers. 
So there are many challenges. Uh, one uh, is that the seismic noise, the, the ground vibrations are of the order 10 to minus uh, 6 meter. Uh, so you have to gain a factor 10 to the 12. <clears throat> you have to uh, reduce the, the, the vibrations of the ground by 20 to the 12. And another uh, challenge is that the wavelength of the light you, you measure is 10 to the minus 6. So you want to split the wavelength in also in 10 to the 12. So you have two factor 10 to the 12. One concerns uh, displacement noise, one uh, is about a readout noise. And then there is the Brownian motion of the atoms uh, uh, composing the mirrors. So you want to measure something that is, is, is uh, of the order of 10 to minus 18. So the Brownian motion, the fact that we are at not, not zero temperature, the atom, atoms vibrate, uh, should be reduced. There are tricks uh, to reduce the Brownian motion. And the other uh, environmental noise, for example, a very dangerous are uh, the noise that you, uh, your, your own noise is the noise that you produce yourself using the electronics or vibrating components. And this took uh, uh, 50 years uh, to arrive to uh, uh, a strain. This is, uh, is uh, in linear spectral density, so now we are below 10 to minus 23 uh, in linear spectral density. Um, uh, so from the first uh, Weber bars uh, in the 60s to uh, the sensitivity uh, of advanced field, advanced LIGO, there are 10, roughly 10 decades. So 10 to minus 14, 10 to minus 24, 10 to minus 23, 9, 10 decades. Um, and, uh, and there is a lot of technology uh, um, in, a, in a gravitational wave detector. Uh, some key components, the mirrors. The mirrors are, uh, are the key component of the interferometer. They should be, uh, there are silica blocks of 40 kilograms, 35 centimeter diameter, and they should be very pure and, uh, and very flat. Uh, the flatness is below one nanometer over 35 centimeters. So it's a very, very flat component. The coatings are very important also. And, uh, and the coatings of uh, the LIGO and Virgo uh, interferometers are made in uh, one of the IN2P3 laboratories in, in Lyon. All the components are isolated. Uh, mm, using a um, pendula, uh, so this is, a, is an optical bench which is a seismic isolator. We cannot see the wire, but there are wires um, uh, suspending this, uh, this very complex op optical bench, and there are under vacuum. And uh, we use very powerful lasers because uh, uh, you need to reduce the photon counting noise, the so-called shot noise. So, uh, you have to count uh, many photons to reduce the fractional error in the number of photons. And of course, suspensions. So we suspend uh, the mirrors, the test mass, to a uh, pendula. Uh, the pendulum is a filter, is a low pass filter. So below the frec resonant frequency uh, of the pendulum, you, you filter the, uh, the, the vibration, the seismic vibration, and so there are uh, chains. Uh, this is, is the Virgo seismic filter. There are chains of uh, seven filters which are 10 meters tall. And at the end, uh, you obtain a, a mirror which is completely isolated from seismic vibration. So that's a, a, a snapshot of the Virgo performances in August 2017. Uh, on the top, you see uh, the horizon, so the distance you, sorry, the range, the binary neutron star range, the distance at which you can, uh, you can see a binary neutron star event, it's uh, uh, in average. Uh, and uh, it, in the, the message is that the, the, the experiment, the detector is quite stable, and uh, he has a duty cycle of 85%. So there are uh, instruments that they are uh, almost uh, all the time, uh, working all the time. And the sensitivity measured in red is almost uh, superposed to the, what uh, uh, is the limitation given by the fundamental noise on the low frequency part is the Brownian motion uh, the Brownian uh, noise and uh, on the high frequency part is the shot noise.
So what what uh, what uh, uh, what was the what were the the key uh, key elements that brought to the detection uh, from Einstein nineteen sixteen to uh, to the first detection? So there were of course prototypes, a lot of technological development. Uh, um, technologies uh, that appeared uh, um, in the 50s, in the 60s, uh, uh, after the war, uh, laser control system, uh, digital control system, and uh, theoretical developments, uh, waveforms, amplitude uh, estimation of the amplitudes, then the discovery of black holes and neutron stars. And Einstein was skeptical that uh, new uh, gravitational wave uh, were uh, useful, uh, but uh, at the time of Einstein, we didn't know about neutron star and black holes. The discovery of the binary pulsar by Alts and Taylor, and of course, uh, uh, motivated people and uh, very uh, strong collaborative work uh, to, to, to detect uh, um, 10 to the minus 21 uh, in strain. So some of the questions for the future, um, which we would like to continue to address, uh, so which are the formation scenarios for black holes, uh, binary black holes? You have seen we have a very massive uh, uh, um, stellar mass black holes. So one of the questions is how these black holes are formed. Uh, which is valued of the Hubble constant? Uh, I will uh, spend a few words later. Uh, is GR the only theory compatible with gravitational observations? For the moment, yes, but uh, it, there, there are ways to test better. Um, um, why the, the gamma ray uh, burst observed is so dim and uh, is there a new class uh, of uh, uh, gamma ray burst discovered, which is the equation of state of neutron star and uh, which is the physics of the supernova. And the very important gravitational way we have seen that uh, there are triggers for electromagnetic observation. So it's uh, the gravitational wave network is a dream of an astronomer. It's, it's a, is, is, a, is, a, is an instrument that observes the sky, all the sky, all the time. So uh, you don't need to point a gravitational de detector, and you don't need to, to observe that during at night uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the network, LIGO Vigo, observes the sky, uh, uh, all the sky, all the time. And I have put also uh, a couple of questions uh, that uh, I know that were, that, that were very important for Pierre, which is the nature of the gravity near the horizon of black holes. Uh, can we prove the early universe with a stochastic background gravitational wave? We, uh, we already t started to, uh, to make statements about the stochastic background gravitational waves. Of course, for the moment, uh, only upper limits, uh, but uh, there are, uh, on the archive, there are a couple of papers uh, about limits, about cosmic string, uh, um, a stochastic background gravitational wave given by cosmic string, of course, upper limit, and also how to use the stochastic background gravitational wave to make uh, statements about uh, uh, non-GR polarization of gravitational waves. So a, a few, a few examples uh, on uh, what uh, has been done and what we can do in the future with the gravitational wave. Using the binary neutron star merger, we could uh, put uh, uh, constraints on the tidal deformability of neutron stars. These plots are taken by the paper, the binary neutron star merger uh, observation in spiral uh, observation paper. And uh, so tidal interaction between neutron stars give the, their imprint on the gravitational wave signal. So we can use the, the phase of the wave to, uh, to, um, to, 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 to make statements of, of, about the tidal def, uh, deformability. And also, and uh, already using the event of 17 of August, we could exclude some equation, extreme equation of state. And in the future, uh, using uh, especially the... Um, the signal at high frequency, you can distinguish between uh, different equations of state. So different equations of state uh, give uh, different uh, um, uh, spectra of uh, gravitational wave at high frequency. Um, and uh, for example, uh, you see in, the, in this work by Luciano Rezzola that uh, identifying the peaks in the gravitational wave in the kilohertz region uh, you can, uh, using this information, you can distinguish between dif different equations of state. Um, 
a new measurement of uh, the Hubble constant. So uh, this uh, is, uh, you know, the, uh, the gravitational wave are standard uh, candles. And uh, if uh, the, we have at the same time the gravitational wave and the light, uh, so the redshift, uh, we can combine the two information and, and extract uh, the value for the Hubble constant. You see the result obtained uh, using the event of 17 of August. The error is still big, uh, especially because uh, there is a big error in the inclination. But uh, we know that having a few tens of events uh, in the next years, uh, we can, uh, um, we can constrain the much better the Hubble constant, uh, probably at the level of a few percent um, in the next year. So um, what, uh, what will happen about the detectors in the next year? So we, uh, um, uh, coming back to Galileo, so, uh, and coming back to the development of electromagnetic uh, astronomy, of the astronomy, so the idea was to go towards better instruments, bigger instruments, better places, and different wavelengths. And for the gravitational wave astronomy, they will be the same path. So better instruments, we are building the better instrument, better and bigger because uh, the, the, the gravitational wave signal is increasing with the uh, length of the instrument. Better places. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the Kagra Japanese detector, which is coming online. It's an underground detector. We know the underground is much better for a gravitational wave detector because there is, there is less seismic noise underground. And uh, we have uh, the first observational scenarios of the three collaborations, uh, which is uh, online uh, uh, since February. Um, it's um, LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA are joining, are joining their effort. And uh, uh, this is, uh, is the uh, uh, observing scenario for the next, uh, uh, for the next five years. So um, we are now between 02 and 03. We restart the observation in, the, in January 2019 with uh, uh, the data taking 03 hopefully uh, also with CAGRA. This, uh, is, uh, this table is a little bit outdated. The idea was to start in, uh, in fall 2018. Uh, the idea is to start in beginning um, 2019. And then there, is, there, is, there will be another phase of upgrade and uh, uh, another data taking call 04. And, uh, you see here the, um, the numbers are the binary neutron star range. So every time we increase the binary neutron star range, you increase the number of events by the, roughly the cube of the distance uh, uh, we observe the events. So the, the, um, the, 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 um, the, uh, during uh, O3, the, the distance will increase uh, by roughly uh, a factor of two means uh, eight times more, more events. And uh, just to finish, uh, um, so I, I go direct to the big picture. So uh, in the next 10 years, we will have some data takings using Virgo, LIGO, and CAGRA, and, uh, and some upgrade phase. And then there, there are already plans to upgrade Virgo and, Laga in, uh, Virgo and LIGO and CAGRA in the present infrastructure. So the same tubes, same, same buildings. Uh, they are called uh, Advanced LIGO Plus, Advanced Virgo Plus. Um, and then uh, we, have, we will be limited by the infrastructures. And uh, the, there are projects to new gravitational wave detection, new infrastructure. So Einstein Telescope is a European project uh, aiming the um, construction of a, a 10 kilometer triangle detector. And uh, there is a similar project in the US, uh, which is called uh, Cosmic Explorer. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, a picture already shown uh, by Antonio Mazero about Einstein telescope. The idea is to have a triangle, so to, to have a detector which is able also to determine the polarization of gravitational wave um, and uh, with arms of uh, 10 kilometers and, and underground. So I, I think uh, um, 
that's uh, that's my basically my last slide i would like to to make just a conclusive remark so the um, the legacy of pierre is uh, is uh, is a uh, 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 a legacy about uh, about uh, Lisa, of course, uh, because uh, he worked uh, a lot in the development of Lisa. But uh, he has also the vision that uh, it, um, the the what was happening in the Earth-based gravitational astronomy was very important. But uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, developing uh, a group, a community here uh, at APC, uh, and um, but also. Uh, Thinking to this uh, uh, new uh, born, uh, new born in gravitational, uh, uh, new born in multi messenger astronomy. Thank you. Donc, désolé pour ça. Uh, J'aime bien, si je peux, um, uh, utiliser mon portable. I like to use my phone as well, uh, but uh, the technology has defeated me this time. Um, a, uh, And sorry as well, uh, désolé uh, au, au français, je voudrais bien parler en français, but I understand that the conference is in English and uh, it is always a source of shame to an English speaker to come and meet uh, people from uh, overseas who all speak my language so well, and yet I am unable to uh, converse in, in yours. So thank you for that. Um, so um, I uh, met Pierre several times and he was very, very important uh, to the development of FutureLearn, as I will explain uh, at some parts in this uh, presentation. Um, so um, he um, was someone that I very much enjoyed working with and my team very much enjoyed working with. He pushed us very hard uh, in terms of stretching the capability of our technology, of our processes, and always challenging our thinking But as a result, we had some of the most extraordinary uh, experiences in dealing with Pierre and the gravity MOOC that he created. Um, so I thought I would uh, just give a bit of perspective on how we see the future of learning uh, and within that talk a little bit about uh, the gravity MOOC uh, as I am doing it and what we did with Pierre. Um, so. Um, I set up FutureLearn just over five years ago. We are a, a private company, but wholly owned and funded by the British Open University. My background uh, was from the BBC, where I spent 15 years and set up the digital aspects of uh, the digital arms of the radio part of the BBC and then the television part. So it became a natural progression to try to work with the Open University, which had always had very close ties to the BBC. Uh, but quite early on, they asked me if I would set up a British response uh, to these things. I had never heard of MOOCs, uh, and uh, the boss of the Open University said to me, well, go and do your research because we need to launch a company in two weeks because British universities are starting to sign up with American uh, startups in this area, Coursera, edX, and we need to freeze the market and tell them there is something better coming from the UK. Uh, so I thought he was mad, but uh, he convinced me and we'd managed it. Uh, at the time, it was just a name, FutureLearn. Um, Believe me, we've had some terrible names before we found that one. Um, and uh, we had to decide how we were going to respond to this world of MOOCs and how we were going to bring something different uh, to uh, something that was kind of exploding around the world. Now, you will know that in those five years, Um, and indeed, we came to the party quite late, uh, so we were a year and a half after Coursera. There has been uh, wild over-optimism and hyping about what MOOCs would do to the world of education, with some claiming that these alone would be um, uh, one of the greatest ways to solve world poverty. I kid you not, I have read such statements. But provoked by this, critics moved to the other side and dismissed MOOCs. Uh, 
as something that was going to disappear in a few uh, years' time and didn't need to be worried about now. And so we have been building FutureLearn within this very polarised argument about MOOCs. But our view has always been that it's not about MOOCs. It is about a world of higher education that is increasingly moving digital. That is my personal view, and that over the next 10, 20, 30 years' time, there will be a fundamental shift in how education is delivered at all levels, including higher education. Um, I actually think it will happen faster than many, but that is, I guess, one of the points of most argument. Um, and MOOCs are just one part of that much broader transformation, but have been a fantastic way to drive innovation within academic institutions that have traditionally struggled to move as quickly uh, into these new markets and opportunities. And the need globally is more acute than it has ever been. Vast shortages of teachers or nurses or engineers uh, or uh, coders or entrepreneurs to drive economic development in developed and developing economies. Huge global skills gaps uh, in France as well as in India as well as in Ghana and driven by uh, trends that you will be familiar with and have debated many times. The globalization of industries, uh, automation coming into industries and market and removing the need for certain jobs. Uh, not just unskilled labor, but increasingly uh, with artificial intelligence, uh, increasingly skilled labor. Uh, whole markets moving digital, as I believe the education sector is moving digital, uh, and a requirement, therefore, for completely new skills and, techno and uh, uh, abilities in order to uh, meet those challenges. And all of that adding up to constant job disruption for people who can no longer expect to keep a job uh, for life uh, and will expect to change jobs multiple times in their career. At each stage, they will probably need to retrain and keep learning new skills. All of which means that the university, in my view, needs to rethink who its audience is and move its focus from uh, teaching the 18 to 25 year old undergrad to postgrad and think about how it is going to serve the needs of society up to the age of uh, retirement and way beyond because there is a vast appetite for learning uh, at all levels of society. Now, I have um, given these kinds of speeches uh, before when I was in radio, and before when I was in television, and now when I'm in education. Uh, and what I've learned over that time is I've seen many people give similar speeches and say, if you don't change, then your broadcaster your media company, your university will disappear in five years. And that's rubbish. It won't happen. Um, and also, I don't think that people really get motivated by being scared. I think that what is happening represents the greatest opportunity there has ever been for a university, for an academic institution, to have genuine impact globally and to reach out to far more people in society than has ever been possible before. Uh, and so how we have positioned FutureLearn is now no longer just thinking about MOOCs, but trying to help our partners to understand uh, and to take advantage of uh, the transformation that is needed to deliver services in new ways. Um, that may... Uh, come down to a whole range of other areas that we have moved into beyond MOOCs now. So we offer full master's degrees available on my mobile phone. Uh, all the learning uh, broken down uh, into this uh, Russian doll approach to learning, as it were, 
with people able to start with short courses and then as they develop their skills and interests move on to shorter flexible credentials that can ultimately stack into new degrees. And our belief is that the traditional world of the degree, the undergraduate master's degree, is something that is worth challenging uh, and something that can be delivered in radically new ways in order to meet the needs of the parent uh, or the person who simply cannot take one year, two years out of their life in order to study within a physical institution or someone who could simply never afford to have the luxury of sitting in one of these seats here. Um, so we are working with our partners to deliver degrees in this way and are now hosting 12 degrees on the platform and soon we'll deliver more. Um, and part of the um, approach and the reason that we, you know, or, or the future learn approach to this that we've been developing over those five years is we took a look at platforms that were out there uh, when we started and um, we thought they looked about as much fun as uh, doing your tax return. Um, none of them worked on this device which we felt was the key to really reaching and engaging with new people all around the world. Um, and many of them um, had pretty poor learning experiences. They would be cameras based, placed at the back of a room here uh, and filming me uh, in an hour-long lecture, which they would then put online with a test and say, we have delivered online learning. Our view was always very different. So we have developed a platform which I don't think I'm going to be able to demonstrate to you on this, and um, uh, I'm torn, but I, I um, uh, which uh, does all of those things and creates an elegant, simple experience. Um, but the key to bringing that platform to life has always been working with universities and particularly with working with academics who are prepared to bring their learning to life and their teaching to life in new ways, not just filming their lectures and putting them online. Uh, and who think about how to make that experience uh, accessible and flexible to people all over the world and how to make it uh, effective and enjoyable. And I would say that one of the best early examples that we ever did of this approach was Pierre's Gravity MOOC. So um, I first uh, met uh, Pierre, it must have been uh, four years ago, uh, in a building just uh, next door, I think. Uh, and uh, I remember I was looking through my notes of the meeting, uh, and I'd written back to the team, uh, I think this could be a really exciting opportunity and Pierre seems a fantastic educator who gets it, who understands what we are trying to say. Um, and uh, some of the ways that uh, he really understood was, um, so I was looking back at um, uh, some of the videos on the course and um, Pierre went out of his way to tell stories that introduced all of those videos and, off, and contextualized often incredibly complex, certainly to me, uh, scientific um, uh, teaching. Uh, so he would, uh, and these were illustrated very skillfully by the team with which uh, Pierre worked. They were brought to life in uh, elegant um, uh, user, um, uh, in elegant uh, backdrops um, and um, uh, all ignited by Pierre's infectious delivery approach. And um, the audience responded uh, in numbers that we had never expected. 
So, um, firstly, we attracted uh, nearly uh, 90,000 people to three runs of this gravity MOOC. Uh, that placed this uh, as our top ever course, um, beaten only by um, English language courses that we had run on the platform. So we were staggered that uh, complex uh, scientific courses could have such a mass following. And Pierre obviously loved this. Um, and one of the things that we'd really focused on in developing our platform was making sure that the learning was social. So we tried uh, to make sure that every step within the course ignited a conversation and ignited discussion between learners. Because that's what we thought was most exciting about MOOCs. Not the ability to just put video on the web, but the ability to get communities of learners learning together and from each other. And the levels of engagement that Pierre saw on his course were far higher than we've seen for most other courses. Uh, and uh, Pierre and his course, some academics that we've worked with were quite frightened by this prospect. And the idea of thousands of people discussing and commenting on their teaching uh, or about the subjects they were discussing. Pierre had none of that fear. He absolutely welcomed it and made it actually central then to what he continued to teach. Um, and so uh, and on some of the uh, steps in the course, we were getting uh, thousands of comments and responses and Pierre and his team were facilitating and hosting all of that discussion. Um, and uh, what we were getting back from learners was that they were blown away by you know, the quality of the, um, the educators like Pierre, like George Smoot, uh, on uh, the course. But it was also the contributions of those other learners and that community that was coming together around the world that they were really valuing. Um, and people also really sort of got how um, passionate Pierre himself was and how hard he and the team had worked to uh, bring to life for a mass uh, community uh, such a complex subject. Now, I think when I first met um, Pierre, um, I, was try I, I was going all around the world trying to get uh, universities outside the UK to understand that we were a global uh, uh, business and a global platform and that we had um, something different to offer in this world of MOOCs. Um, but at the time, I was looking back over the deck I used and uh, there was no slide that said how many learners we had attracted. And that's probably because I was a bit worried about it because we'd still only attracted 100,000, 200,000 in total. Um, so five years on, um, we've attracted uh, nearly 8 million learners uh, from just about every country in the world. Uh, most of them are female, uh, so 60%. Most of them are in work. Uh, and uh, between the ages of 26 and 45, so not the traditional uh, student group but a much broader community of people and coming together with a whole different range of motivations. So people who want to progress their career uh, or are preparing for a life change, uh, they're preparing uh, for their next career or further study options, so they want to explore different uh, routes. Um, they're looking to flourish in different areas of life, uh, address new problems uh, from uh, uh, drugs and addiction within their family uh, circle, uh, or dementia, or end-of-life care, uh, or, or personal health and well-being. Um, uh, people uh, taking on um, uh, new challenges and trying out <coughs> new hobbies. Um, and all of this really, sort of, uh, we cap categorize as people learning for life. Uh, and uh, we our philosophy is that the future of learning needs to embrace 
all of those different motivations, all of those different learners, all of those different life stages, uh, and utilize, and one can now utilize digital technologies to bring them together uh, and encourage them to learn from each other. So we have, uh, on our platform, created effectively a social network for learning, where on average half of the people will uh, leave at least one comment uh, on the course, which is many, many times what we see on other similar areas. And those people who get involved uh, and socially interact are six times more likely um, to uh, complete the course than those who don't. Um, so all of this social uh, sort of, uh, networking, again, was enthusiastically embraced by Pierre. Um, and uh, he was one of the first real ex uh, you know, academics who grabbed hold of what we were offering and brought it to life in new ways. Um, but he also took it further. So he wasn't content with just engaging with these learners online. Uh, he wanted to meet as many of them as he could. Um, so uh, he organized uh, the Gravital, Gravitational Waves Fiesta, uh, and he invited uh, 40,000 learners uh, to come, uh, so all the people who'd uh, uh, progressed in his gravity course, uh, to come to Paris Diderot in February 2016. And he hosted a fantastic event, uh, which was, um, as the program said, presentations and discussions on the discovery of gravitational waves and on the status of the LISA Pathfinder mission. We'll organize visits of experimental labs and the data center where LISA Pathfinder data is received. Uh, and we'll organize a hangout uh, in the late afternoon of Monday 29th to which all those who can't come to Paris may participate. Always thinking of his global community. Uh, and it would also be on YouTube. Uh, and my, um, I had uh, one of my producers uh, here who worked with Pierre, uh, who shared with me uh, these photos uh, of the event. Um, and um, she said to me, uh, and I thought I'd share, um, that she just felt this was, uh, um, this summed up Pierre, his passion, his willingness to do this, to move outside of what would traditionally be seen as Sort of required of someone teaching one of these courses, uh, and she, as I, feel very lucky to have worked with them. Um, but I guess uh, the final thing I'd say um, before taking questions and um, is uh, that, as I said, I, I first met Pierre four years ago. FutureLearn was in its infancy uh, and was still very much, uh, it was not a foregone conclusion that we would survive. Uh, or that we would be able to move outside the UK and work with international partners. Uh, so again, um, part of our mission had always been to try to build a global network of partnerships to really try and deliver something big and dynamic and fresh and new in learning. But when I, I again, went back to that deck that I uh, brought in to uh, meet Pierre and um, Anne Vanet from... Uh, Paris Didot, who introduced me, uh, and um, these were our partners at the time. They were almost all from the UK. We had one Australian partner, one Irish partner, um, and um, I, w I really was looking for um, someone to show confidence and faith uh, and be prepared to innovate with a British platform that no one had heard about. And Paris Diderot were the first... Uh, continental European university to make that commitment, to try out that innovation, uh, and to bring something to life. Um, we've now expanded that UK partnership to nearly 60 partners, most of the top universities in the UK, and a whole range of other specialist uh, uh, institutions. Uh, but outside the UK now, Parry Diderot um, has been joined by universities from across Europe, other institutions in France um, and across uh, Australia, where we now have a dozen partners, across the US, across South America, across Africa. Uh, and so I'm very, very grateful, and everyone at FutureLearn should be, for the faith shown in us at a very early stage. 
and I guess my final word on, on where I see the kind of future of learning going is for these groupings of universities and non-university partners, such as the European Space Agency, to become more than just um, groupings that sit on the same platform, come to the same conferences sometime. We think that we're creating the means for these organizations to collaborate in ways they've never done before. Uh, as one of those universities said to me, what we love about you and your platform is you're Switzerland. We don't have to argue about us using our IT infrastructure, us using our pedagogic approach, whether our content will sit with yours, because we're all working in the same way on your platform. So potentially, that means we can collaborate to create new degrees, <coughs> new credentials, uh, new approaches to delivering education globally for a workforce and a student base and a research base that needs to operate globally. So if we can really drive that collaboration, then we believe we can really drive powerful innovation. And some of that innovation uh, may enable us to think really big and maybe fulfill some of that early hype about MOOCs and be able to really tackle some of the global educational challenges by working together and thinking big. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you for this very inspiring talk. I'm just going to multitask while we're doing it, see if I can get my technology working. But, uh, so go ahead, I am listening. J'écoute. Uh, thank you. So uh, I, was, I want to ask you more about what your view is of the, the maximum promise of uh, MOOCs or, or maybe your platform in general. So if this kind of collaboration that you envisage takes place and this innov innovation takes place, what do you think is a realistic achievement goal that, that uh, one could expect? I mean, as opposed to the hype that you, you yep. said is really not useful. I mean, look, I, I, my, my belief is that um, you have the vast need um, in developed and developing societies. Uh, and uh, so you have enormous demand and the supply is locked in institutions like this. Uh, largely based in those physical locations. In order to meet the scale of demand, the answer can only, in my mind, be digital. So whether MOOCs are you know, part of that or not, if we are going to meet the challenge of teaching, of, of training up tens of millions of new teachers uh, around the world uh, over the next five, 10 years, we're not gonna build enough buildings to be able to do that. So. The promise has to be, for me, um, how can one continue to innovate in delivering effective learning experiences through digital technologies? Uh, digital technologies that are you know, viewable on this device, because this is you know, the most pervasive device on the planet. Um, and uh, in our experience, you know, we are delivering um, up to full master's degrees now, broken down through this platform. So obviously, I, was, I, I you know, became very impatient very early on with the claims that, uh, uh, with people bringing up a, a student from uh, Pakistan and saying, look, this person can now go to Harvard because of what we've done. Um, and, but, you know, if you now look, I think, 80 million people have signed up to MOOCs in those five years. Um, I think uh, hundreds and hundreds of universities have delivered courses in this way. Um, there are now thousands and thousands of courses covering the whole sort of, uh, waterfront from business and management and healthcare and science to ancient history and literature. Um, and uh, they're increasingly being organized into more and more valuable qualifications and credentials that actually mean something to someone in India or in Ghana that, wow, maybe I can now get a qualification from MIT or from Pari Didero. So in my view, we are on a journey 
to a widespread transformation of the industry. The only thing I think one can debate is whether is the pace at which that transformation will go. Will it be the next five years? Will it be the next 10 years? Will it be the next 50 years? But the, d the demand needs us to work out the solution. And I think MOOCs have been a great start for us. Uh, you have been rather convincing about the potential of the MOOCs, but I feel very frustrated not having seen any sample of what uh, future learn and uh, okay okay you're, been, you're absolutely right so while we're talking it's, uh, it's you're crazy. absolutely right so while we're talking we will uh, we will bring it up uh, and i will find pierre's mooc because it would be criminal not to do that but please ask me another question while um uh, while i do that you can I, I, all like watch my a comment that goes directly to this you know, when when we were doing this Pierre, we, i calculated for us for both for pierre and for me this quickly became more than a quarter of our student contact hours of our whole life. That is, in a two-year period, right? So the history was we did this in French first, and it was, it was done on FUN. Yep. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce it in French, but FUN. And it was surprisingly successful. We got between four and 5,000 students in that first semester. It was the spring semester. And then Future Learned approached and said, we were planning to run it again in French in the fall semester and said they would like to do it in English. And Pierre, you know, jumped at the opportunity because he made a positive impression on him. And we re-recorded re some of the, the material. And, and uh, I have an email, which I can find somewhere, from the early days, like two or three days after registration was open. And Pierre said, we have 45,000 people signed up. How are we going to do this? And I sent back the note saying, I hope we get to 100,000 because it's just as easy to do 100,000 as 45,000. And we could be <laughs> in the Guinness Book of Records, right? And, and we came close, but we didn't yeah. make it. But I said, it's Future Lund's responsibility to deliver the platforms and deliver the, the, the material. It's us to deliver the answers. But if we have 40,000 students or 100,000 students, you're still going to give the answers to the people each day online statistically, and your interactions in the live, and a lot of stuff is pre-recorded, and the interactions. So, we, you know, at the time, Pierre had his own instincts and own experience. I didn't appreciate how much teaching he had behind him and how good a teacher he was at the time because he'd been director for some time. And I went and studied how the inverted classroom and how, and I went and looked at some of Coursera stuff. At the time, Coursera had more than a third of all the courses online that there were, and I went and looked at some of those examples. And we agreed in this kind of format, which is the backwards the inverted classroom, where you have lecturers that are concepts and then other concepts. If you look for each example, there are several things each week. Each concept has several videos and several quizzes and so forth that go with it. It's quite a, you know, a spectacular kind of thing. And I was studying that, and Pierre was figuring out what was the topics and what, what he wanted to cover. In, in the talk, and I, I say it was a really great experience because the students gave us such great feedback, and the English turned out to be more powerful than French just because so many more people around the world who are studying science knew English, right? Thank you. Um, so uh, if, if I may, um, uh, so, so I guess the additional thing I'd say, as well as being in English, um, is, um, and one of the things we saw on the course, and I don't know whether it felt it to you, but uh, we put real emphasis on discussion and social interaction. And uh, I suspect that also being on this platform, you uh, got a much greater experience of that and so on. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's one of the things that we would um, hope. Let, let me just... We had strong emphasis on that too. Yeah. Because I believe for a long time that students' participation in discussion sections and in homework, or quizzes in this case, were where they actually did the real part of their learning. Right? Yeah. Um, so I've, um, I've, I've got the course up on my uh, laptop. Um, so just to prove that it does work on mobile. So uh, it's a fully responsive uh, site. That's the thing I was trying to show off uh, earlier. Um, but, um, but let's just have a look at um, uh, a bit of the course. So uh, this is the introduction. Um, and um, 
So you'll see already 322 comments just on that. Um, so this is now, uh, this was uh, uh, a year or two ago when this ran, uh, but a few people have come back to uh, just express their own um, uh, shock and uh, condolences uh, when they learned about uh, Pierre's um, uh, death. So um, uh, the, the second step is for uh, people to start introducing themselves, and um, uh, Pierre and George uh, were the first to do that, of course, but then uh, you have... Uh, nearly 700 comments of people then uh, introducing themselves and a very, very international audience. So just, I haven't looked at this, but this is uh, Melinda from Kansas uh, and uh, Nikola Miljevic, doesn't say where they're from, um, but, uh, you know, a really sort of powerful global community. And I think it's quite exciting when you see these communities coming together. Um, and then some instructions, but the one I, I, I was looking at earlier and I thought was that great example of storytelling was this. Um, so um, I doubt we're going to get the audio, unfortunately, um, uh, unless uh, it's obvious. Would that work? Um, let's see. Um, it may not. I didn't set this up before. Our story starts in the Cathedral of Pisa in 1583, exactly. We are here with a medical student, a young 19-year-old medical student with the name of Galileo Galilei. You might know him. And precisely at that moment, an earthquake strikes in Tuscany. And Galilei notices that the chandeliers of the cathedral are swinging because of the motion of the earth, but it notices that they are swinging with a period which does not depend on the weight of the chandeliers, but depends only on the length of the rope of each chandelier. So a very heavy chandelier is swinging the same period as a light one, as long as the length of So what I just love about that um, is the point I was making about storytelling. So many academics launch straight into, you know, their traditional teaching, etc. One of the things we didn't even have to teach, you know, he'd already done it, was bringing things to life, you know, contextualizing them through stories. And you really feel he's talking to you uh, and, you know, he's sharing a fascinating story that goes back through the ages. And, you know, we show this to other educators to say, you know, this is how we want to bring things to life on future learn. I've spoken a bit too long, though, I think, so I think Thank we should... Thank you. I mean, it was, I think draw it was, that to a close. It was, uh, it was exact tone of his presence. I had a silly question. Do you think we can use MOOC against Brexit? But anyway. <laughs> if, <Because>. uh, <laughs> I wish we could. So, so, uh, so I think... Thank you very much, Thank Simon. you, sir. Again, uh, thanks.